The Sustainability Now Telesummit is honored to share audacious ideas and innovative solutions from more than 30 experts from around the globe. Learn how we can work together to shape a world that works. Here's your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome back to the Sustainability Now Telesummit, shaping a world that works. You have the rare pleasure now of hearing from Mike Stritsky, who is what many people believe to be a mad scientist, and what he really is is a remarkable visionary pioneering the area of hydrogen fuel. And Mike, it's our pleasure to have you here for people to hear how they can actually be off grid and the the beauties of hydrogen energy. And we're excited to talk to you today. Thanks so much. Yes, thanks for having me. So Mike, will you tell us a little bit about, well, you have a presentation and, and some of these things will fit into the presentation, but I'm wondering if you can just sort of give us a foundation about hydrogen energy and how it works and why we would want to use hydrogen energy. Well, I'll give you a little bit of uh, evolution here. Okay, great. So uh, the hydrogen fuel cell was discovered by Sir William Grove in the 1800s. It wasn't until NASA came along and needed a fuel source that worked in outer space, the most hazardous environment known to man. So for the last 60 years, NASA has used hydrogen to provide the astronauts with their drinking water, heat, and electricity in this hazardous environment. And they continue to do so today. So in that last 60 years, the technology has gotten better as material sciences and research and, and other discoveries to the point now where it's becoming affordable to the average citizen to have in their home. The, as people remember, you know, when computers first came out, no one thought that they would ever be able to afford to have a home computer, you know, when these things took up several buildings and, you know, had the computer power of the first calculators. Now the iPhone has six times more power than the first six manned missions to Apollo. Technology evolves, it becomes cheaper, it becomes better as it becomes mass produced and the infrastructure becomes better as it gets widely adopted. Hydrogen is no different. The second place that it's been used here on Spaceship Earth has been to back up the 911 system. So all of the major cities are under tremendous fines every minute that that 911 system is out. Plus people die. They put batteries in, but batteries became unreliable. So to back up the batteries, they put in a hydrogen fuel cell and storage tank. So when the, the grid goes down like uh, Hurricane Katrina, you can power for 72 hours instead of six. So that's the difference between people living and dying. Things were pretty expensive then, it was limited use, but they didn't mind paying the price because it was in a must have. US military are doing this right now for all their new Humvees. All the new Humvees are now fuel cells. They put in a project up in China Lake in Las Vegas. They have put solar hydrogen plants all over the world. They put them in submarines you know, electric subs for the uh, Navy SEALs. So the technology is getting, you know, been the last 10 years in that realm. Now what's happened is you've had Toyota comes along and, and the major automakers. So for the last 15 years, they've been working on taking the car out of the automotive equation. Right now, they can no longer make the emission standards that the, the EPA is regulating for them to have for these vehicles. It's not only the US burning now, it's the entire world. China and India are going into the machine age and the amount of emissions that are happening now is unprecedented in world history. So to think that man doesn't have a difference on planet earth or global warming isn't happening, better look at physics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So right now we're seeing all of this transpi transpire in real time. Uh, and the need for this is greatly. 80% of every piece of matter in the universe is hydrogen. Why not use the most abundant fuel source in the universe? Let me ask you a question. I think that people have an association of hydrogen to the hydrogen bomb. And we are not splitting atoms here. Okay, so, so we're not co co creating nuclear fission. We're burning, we're, I should say, we're reconverting a gas into its base elements. It happens all the time. It goes from water to hydrogen, hydrogen to water, just like it goes from 
that steam to water and water to steam. We're just doing another conversion process that Mother Nature does every single day. So we can dispel the safety fear. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is safer than any fossil fuel we already know. And in this day of lawyers, if it wasn't safer than gasoline, diesel fuel, propane, natural gas, we wouldn't be doing it. I can take a hydrogen fuel cell with hydrogen on an aircraft anywhere in the world, but you can't take bottled water. So, I mean, I, I don't know that it gets any safer than that. Okay, great. I mean, they've got these hydrogen cars from 10 story buildings, they've set them on fire, they put machine gun tracer rounds into them. This is as safe as they get. Remember, these cars are going in home garages. When was the last time you heard a hydrogen car ignite and burn the garage down? So, you know, look at, look at the accidents. Even the Hindenburg, basically with 10 million cubic feet of hydrogen in it, only burned. And it burned for a tenth of a second. What people saw coming down in that, in that event, was the skin of the airship, which was aluminum oxide, rocket fuel, and the diesel tanks. When you burn hydrogen, you get water and it's a clear flame. So obviously, and most of the people lived. So it really, it really was a media event. It had nothing to do with the safety of hydrogen. There was no explosion. If that were natural gas, you'd have blown up half of New Jersey. Okay, right. this is lighter than air. It travels at 45 miles an hour into outer space. Well, it's number one on the periodic table. And it's the most energy dense molecule in the universe. Wonderful. And you have spent how long learning how to tap into this resource? About 35 years. So you are way ahead of the curve. I knew this worked when I did the first fuel cell vehicles back in the 90s. I built my own for the American Tour de Sol. We did the first commercial purchase of fuel cells outside the US space program by converting uh, 56 variable message signs from the Department of Transportation to run on hydrogen because solar was not making it. Wow. So, so basically, this stuff solves problems. It's been very expensive, but now the costs are coming down to the real world. Since the advent of graphene, we can now do large cross-sectional areas of, of fuel cell plates with this new substance where we get hundreds of square feet in the same place we could only get 10. So now we can use less active catalysts like cobalt and nickel to do this. So it takes all the expense out of it. So you're making a more energy dense fuel cell with less precious metals, or I should say with no precious metals. So yeah. let's, let's jump into your presentation because we're going to talk about, well, your history and, and the things that you've got going. And also we have some live footage to be able to augment the presentation. All right, so uh, my presentation that I use at a lot of uh, different places, I just spoke at Princeton University and Pepperdine, and I gave this presentation as well. It's a little bit of a 30-year history here on hydrogen, on renewable energy, some of the projects we've done early on, on some of the early adopters. This was one of the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles I did called the New Jersey uh, Genesis. This one was a prototype car from Ford Motor Company that we entered in the American Tour de Sol and is still the world record holder for range for a fuel cell vehicle in the world. When was this? Um, I built this in 2000. It won the President's Award for the Environment, zero emissions, 130 miles an hour. It did actually 470 miles on a single charge. The range record for that was 401. We broke that and we still hold it today on the equivalent of one gallon of gasoline and energy. This vehicle is on display here at the Hydrogen House. We're debating on whether to leave it like it is or turn it into a student project and upgrade it to the latest technology by taking Mirai fuel cell parts and doing it. So I'm kind of torn. The one you see here is I spent two years in Paris working with Peugeot to develop a fuel cell firefighting vehicle that was like a submarine that could go in the channel between France and England and pull people out or put out fires. Uh, if anybody remembers the Channel Fire, it burned for weeks. They went in with the fire trucks. There wasn't an ox enough oxygen to run the internal combustion engines. They died in the middle of the tunnel and all the firefighters died with them. Wow. Once their oxygen ran out, they couldn't get anything in there. The electric battery cars didn't have the range to make the whole length of the channel in and out. This car makes its own hydrogen. It could go in and out of the channel several times on one refueling and contained its own oxygen atmosphere so that it could run into a low oxygen environment and not suffocate uh, the firefighters. Do they still use this? 
Uh, yeah, this is still in use today. They built several of them. That's extraordinary. And it won all kinds of awards at the Paris Auto Show. It's not everything that you build, they turn into a Tonka truck. So it was kind of <laughs> cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, this is the first hydrogen fuel cell vehicle to ever enter a competition in 1997. This is called the New Jersey Venture. I built this with the New Jersey Department of Transportation. We took an electric car at the time, which was called Selectria, that we had two of these left over from an ARPA project where we were testing cold weather testing on batteries and the effect on range. So we took one of these cars and we decided we were gonna enter it in the American Tour de Sol and yank a lot of the stuff out of it, put a hydrogen fuel cell system in it, put storage in it, and enter it in the Tour de Sol. So we won the Engineering Excellence Award that year. We had the largest team in tour history of about 50 kids from seven colleges, six high schools, nine government agencies were all involved in this, including the Department of Energy. So this was the groundbreaker, the shot heard around the world. And this was 97. This is 1997, yeah. It's remarkable. So We've had this technology for... Uh, We've had it, yeah. Time. We've had it since NASA, since, since the 1960s. And what's the barrier, do you think, that has been to adoption? The barrier to adoption early on was cost. But as this thing started to become commercializable, then it was all the big buck businesses it would replace. That makes sense. I mean, how dare you cure the disease? How dare you? You know, okay. it would be like us curing cancer today, uh, diabetes, you know, AIDS, any of the big drug markets. Gotcha. And now the environment has changed so that people are recognizing we have to replace fossil fuel. A new generation is coming up saying, I'm not going to have a world unless we fix this. That's right. You know, the older generation say, I got mine. Here's the problem. I, I, I'm giving you a broken down piece of garbage. You got to fix it. Yeah got all the miles out of it. I got mine. Yep. This is something we're working on in uh, California. This is a purification plant that we take that we take sewage and we turn it into hydrogen gas. Remember I mentioned the fact that 80% of all matter in the universe is hydrogen. So this is a device that converts matter back into hydrogen gas, water, and high grade fertilizer. We built this pilot in Malibu and now we're building, you know, bigger equipment and I'm doing one here at the hydrogen house where no sewage will ever be in the ground again. So all of your energy plants are gonna turn into being landfills and sewage treatment plants. Right now, the biggest users of electricity, they'll become the biggest producers of electricity. That's a beautiful uh, shift of a paradigm. How long does it take to make this transformation from sewage to drinking water? About five minutes with no chemicals. And We're using the power of water to clean water. That's extraordinary. What's the volume that you can do in five minutes? It depends on the size of the machine. This is totally scalable. Right now I'm doing one for my house here just to prove it can be done above ground. So picture no more land losses, no more groundwater contamination. You are your own sewage treatment plant, energy plant, you know, and you can grow your own food with this fertilizer. It has no heavy metals in it and we can extract the hydrogen without throwing a carbon into the air. Wow. Is this something that can be used in a residential context? Yes. This can okay. do everything from, you know, a sewage treatment size plant all the way, you know, to a home. And it's not yet commercially available? It's not. I have to, I'm doing a lot of patent work on this right now to finish it up so that I can release it to the public without having everything distorted or stolen. So where can people watch your progress so that we can all jump on the bandwagon when it's available? <laughs> I'm not going to be putting out any public demonstrations till after the patent pendings are filed. Okay. Do we At have that a point, time frame? we're probably about a year away from that. Okay. All right. Very good. So we're looking at 2020 sometime. Yeah. Wonderful. I mean, yeah, you're, you're looking at the top pipe on the right-hand slide of raw sewage coming out of the toilets. And after five minutes, you see stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. This is remarkable. This is a game changer, Mike. A lot of energy in water. A lot of energy in sewage. Remember, everything around us is matter vibrating at a different frequency, including us. All we have to do is learn how to convert matter into different states without using toxic chemicals. Do it the way Mother Nature does it. Back around, I think this was 2007, 
This was a, we built a hydrogen fuel cell golf cart for the Mohican Sun Casino to run all the diplomats around. And this is still in use today. So I built this using a uh, new view fuel cell. And, uh, you know, these things last for years. The, the fuel cells in my house are already 14 years old. What's the expected lifespan? We don't know, but I've had, I got about 28 years on some of the stuff that's here. Wow. Yeah, so these were the variable message signs that we did for a commercial purchase outside the U.S. space program. This was done with the New Jersey Department of Transportation. We actually built 56 units and they were in operation for 17 years. They love these signs because they know they would never go dead. They'd never, they wouldn't be chiseling them out of a snowbank and uh, they won't be putting life and limb at risk. You know, they basically retired them due to attrition and they were not happy about uh, getting rid of them because they still work just fine even after 17 years. So uh, this next slide is the Duffy fuel cell electric boat I built uh, in 2005 in Southern California for the Southern California Coastal Management District. So this is basically a fuel cell engine. We took out half of the batteries. We put a hydrogen generator in it along with a hydrogen fuel cell. The typical range of these boats were somewhere around 60 miles. This one with our setup did 360 miles with half the batteries. And these are the same boats they use in Disney World for moving people back and forth across the lagoon in, um, in Disneyland. But uh, this boat is here at the Hydrogen House. We're retrofitting it with new technology and we're gonna put it back into service uh, as a ferry. Same thing we did with an ocean racer, as you can see here. This whole boat weighs 700 pounds. It's made out of composite carbon and it holds the world record between Catalina Island and Newport Beach, California for distance. This is what's called a wave piercing design, which means most boats go up and down over the waves. This is the exact length of the crest of the bottom and the top of the wave. So basically this goes through the wave. So the tail is leaving the wave as the front nose is going through it. It's what's called wave piercing design. It's a trimaran really cool piece of technology but we put a fuel cell in it and uh you know the boat has the capability of traveling around the world with wind turbines and solar flexible solar on the deck yep. so um this next slide is a uh hydrogen fuel cell plane that we did for nasa it was done with wpi worcester polytech and uh the public safety technology center ctc it had a hydrogen engine battery bank and it had a uh, electric motor the plane is all composite carbon, so it was the latest technology at the time we did it. You know, just to show you, fuel cells excel where weight is an issue. If you take a traditional plane, uh, a jet aircraft we fly, it puts millions of tons of liquid fuel, turns it into a gas, and leaves it in our atmosphere to rain all over the planet. This plane makes water, something that we do want, pure water, drinkable water, all right? In addition to that, you're paying no weight penalty for the fuel. You're not carrying around 40,000 pounds of fuel. Hydrogen weighs as much empty as it does full, you know? So you're, you're not having the weight factor and that's huge in anything to do with aviation. The drones right now that we do for the military are all powered with hydrogen fuel cells because you can get four hours of runtime, not 45 minutes because you're not carrying heavy batteries. And refueling, you don't have to wait eight to 24 hours to charge the batteries. Fueling takes four minutes. So the advantage of this technology is huge. This was something I built in 2010. It's called the Hydra. So it has solar, hydrogen, microgrid, along with water purification. So if you look at this slide, this is processing water in real time using a physical membrane so people won't get sick. So this was designed originally for third world countries in disaster. So the system is using new technology, which is called ultrafiltration. So we go through a particulate filter, charcoal activated, and then into the ultrafiltration. The ultrafiltration is a filter that's 0.05 microns, which is 100 times smaller than your household filter. And it filters out stuff like bacteria, chromium, acid, lead, any kind of particle size that's, that won't go through. 100% virus removal, 100% bacteria removal, too big to go through the filter. Water purification uses chemicals. They use chlorine, they use bleach, they use all kinds of things, which is expensive and hard to get in a disaster situation. It's another product you have to truck in, and it's questionable how good it is for you. The hydro unit does it 
by just filtering out all those things. When it gets to a pressure, it back flushes. We use a solar cooker to get rid of everything and make it inert again. The uh, water that comes out, obviously you see what goes in and what, what I'm drinking coming out. So this machine makes food grade water uh, out of any fresh water source. I could literally put this in my septic tank and drink the water. So what's different between this and the other water filtration system that you showed earlier? The one is geared for sewage. This one's geared for drinking water. Okay. Okay, one is geared for water reuse. I could add the hydra to this and then make the drinking water. So there are different technologies. One is, one is good for sewage because it ruptures all the biologics, gets rid of all the radiation, and it, it basically makes all the heavy metals, which is the, the important part in there, inert. So you're really cleaning sewage up to a point, you know, where it's, it's basically or, organic with nothing in it. Is this also commercially available currently? Yes. And all what the pieces that I use in, in all my equipment, except for stuff I can't find on the market, is, um, is off the shelf. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. So basically the equipment, I'm a systems integrator. I take parts and pieces and I build the machine. So this, what would be a price point for something like this? Uh, these are somewhere around uh, 195,000. Okay. They'll do 30,000 gallons of water a day. Okay. So, you know, you can do a small city. Now, average person needs about two gallons of water to survive. Uh, which is drinking and cooking. Okay. So, you know, in a disaster situation, that's what you need. Okay. So this is a, a little bit about the house, why it works, how it works. So my house is on the left. On the top right is the geothermal system. On the bottom, I have big screen TVs. I got hot tubs, everything you'd find in a normal house. I'm not eating tree bark. So <laughs> this is as traditional as you're going to get. The two things that provide all the energy I need for my house are the geothermal, where I extract the uh, energy from the ground as a huge heat sink, and the solar panels. And then everything rest is just converting that energy into hydrogen. So this is, hi so this is hydrogen from my system. Okay, so we're taking it out. This is connected to all the tanks that are outside. So hydrogen and helium are lighter than air. So what we're doing here is just demonstrating that I'm actually making hydrogen here. So what happens when you have a hydrogen leak 45 miles an hour into outer space? So it doesn't stick around and wait for an ignition source and explode like regular fossil fuel. This is much safer than any other fuel that we know uh, because it, it gets away from the source from the leak. Uh, Every major automaker are building fuel cell vehicles because they're safer than gasoline. If we were picking a fuel, you know, now instead of 100 years ago, we would never pick gasoline. It's too volatile, too explosive, uh, and poses too many dangers. How many people have died all over the world from tankers exploding, oil rigs, you know, that never happens with hydrogen. Hydrogen without the proper ratio of oxygen won't even burn. Look at the Hindenburg. The Hindenburg had 3 million cubic feet of hydrogen in it, and it didn't explode. It took a tenth of a second to burn, and what people saw that coming down in the event was the diesel tanks and the skin of the airship, which was rocket fuel, aluminum oxide burning. So hydrogen is the outstanding winner as far as safety for fuel goes because, it's, because of the, uh, the properties of it. It's element one on the periodic table, and it makes up uh, eighty percent of all matter in the universe and that's why they use it in outer space because you can find hydrogen everywhere so these are small electrolyzers these basically take deionized water and convert them through a fuel cell stack into hydrogen and oxygen so the electricity goes in here and the hydrogen goes out through this small tiny line and oxygen gets vented out through the top through this vent so this is a small scale of what we do for the house. So these things are all entirely scalable. These are the small scale ones. The large scale ones are the ones you see sitting over here that will do two kilograms a day. These will do 200 cc's a day. So there's a huge difference, but these can be done all the way up to power plant size. So the technology, like I said, is totally scalable. The cylinders are, are being filled with hydrogen. They're full of material called nickel metal hydride, which means it, it's a metal that absorbs hydrogen. 
So when you put this in under pressure, the metal acts like a sponge, absorbs the hydrogen, so you can get a lot more hydrogen in the given space. So this is one of the technologies that's going to help the hydrogen economy move forward because you don't need a 10,000 pound compressor. You can do it right off of the electrolyzer stack. So these are small handheld fuel cells. These are aircraft legal. You can take anywhere in the world. I can throw these into a box for 200 years, take them out and they work. Show me a battery in the world that you can do that. So this has hydrogen gas in here. This is a fuel cell, no battery. So I just take it and I screw it in and that releases the gas into the fuel cell. It'll take a few minutes to warm up. The light will go red and then it'll go blue. And that's when it's generating power. Same thing here. These have USB ports in it, so anything that uses a USB, you can use off of these. So, uh, these are for sale on the website. I worked on these. This is my uh, 2002 patent. So this one's producing power. And you said the charge in that will do what? Uh, this will run, this will charge your iPhone two and a half times, or it'll run, it'll charge an iPad or once, or it'll use, it, it'll charge, a, it'll run an LED flashlight for about uh, two weeks. Okay, I just finished filling this uh, electrolyzer up with deionized water, and I just fired it up. This has a palladium uh, catalyst in there that's going to take about an hour or two to heat up before it's ready to generate high purity hydrogen. So we have lines moving across the screen. The faster they move, the closer it gets to ready. And then the numbers will come back on when everything's heated up and it's ready to generate hydrogen. I'll press this button here. That will now generate hydrogen that will fill these two nickel metal hydride cylinders in this unit here. Um, once that's full, the unit will shut down again. But this unit could be hooked to solar panels and just run this to make the hydrogen. So this unit can be taken anywhere in the world. This is a Red Cross unit. We actually take this all over the world to run our display whenever we're, you know, in the Caribbean or a foreign country. That's what we do. But this will put out two kilowatts. This is enough for an average house. You can hang this on the wall in a closet. You can put a hydrogen source in there. You push a button, instant power. This unit here is the electrolyzer unit. This unit takes solar energy and it fills the 12 1,000 gallon propane tanks in three months uh, for the hydrogen house. It provides cooking gas, heating gas, and fuel for the vehicle all from the same source. So this stack here splits it off into hydrogen and oxygen. It takes 24 volt DC electricity in. These are the water filters in the unit. This is the gas separator, this is the hydrogen separator, and that's the recirculation pump. All right, this unit has been here for the last uh, 14 years. So these things have very long lives, as long as the water you put in is clean. But these are fuel, I just purchased two fuel cells that we're gonna be integrating into a Polaris Ranger and a jewel box. These are gonna be student projects. This is a 1.1 kilowatt uh, GenCore manufactured by Plug Power in Albany. So this will take hydrogen gas in. This will put out electricity out up here. And the only byproduct is water and heat. This is what we have in the um, hydrogen home that we built in Pennington. And that's been operating for the last four years. So this one will go in, one will go in my Ranger, the other one will go in the jewel box. But these are the commercially produced fuel cells. Currently, fuel, cell, fuel cells are being produced in, in commercial volumes in forklifts. That's the primary business of plug power is to do fuel cell forklifts. So the material handling. The advantage to that is you use one forklift instead of needing three for a 24 hour shift. You don't have to have one forklift charging why another one is uh, in use. So you're looking at fill ups of four minutes on these rather than 12 hours. So this is cost effective right now. And as we move along the, p the pike, we're going to see that these are going to get cheaper and cheaper. This, one of these will be in every house, and you'll be generating your own power through standardized microgrids. That's the way it's going to be in the next couple of years. We've got to get out of the business of burning fossil fuel, because all we're doing is heating up the planet and poisoning the air that we breathe. So th this is the solution to turn the ship around and go the other way. 
involves converting existing commercial vehicles over to run on solar hydrogen instead of running on battery power. This is a perfect example. We've added solar to this and we've added a hydrogen fuel cell and storage tank. So we're looking at this vehicle having a range of 125 miles rather than on batteries where it has 25. Um, in the distance, we have a hydrogen boat that we're converting over as well. That one is a world record holder and I have another fuel cell car underneath the tarp here that I built in 2000. So all of these components are all coming mainstream. I was just 30 years ahead of my time. So uh, in the next couple years, we're gonna see people that know what a fuel cell is instead of people who say, fuel cell what? <laughs> so uh, we're, we're doing a paradigm change. It's the same way with landlines and cell phones. You know, there was a time in the 80s, no one knew what a cell phone was or a cell phone tower. But now everybody, it's part of everybody's life. Fuel cells and hydrogen are gonna be the same. There are going to be a lot of people that are going to fight it till the end, try to get every last dollar out of fossil fuel before it flips. But one thing for sure is it's going to flip. When you have you know, some of the largest companies in the world investing in this technology now, you know that it's going to happen. It's not going to be a matter of you know, if, it'll be when. So basically the energy systems here at the hydrogen house consist of solar uh, and geothermal. There's not enough wind here to uh, actually drive a wind turbine, even though I have one here. Uh, the solar panels you see on the garage here consist of 27 kilowatts of power, um, which is more than enough to do uh, cooking gas, heating gas, fuel for the vehicle, and heat and air conditioning. Uh, the house runs on an energy cycle where we make all our hydrogen in the springtime. We sell back to the grid the entire summer where they send me a $4,000 check. And then during the fall, we're neutral. And during the winter, I pull off the hydrogen I made in the spring, run it through the fuel cell at the end of the garage, get the heat, water, electricity back again, and then the whole cycle starts all over again. The nice thing about hydrogen is it has no shelf life. It's as good today as 100 million years from now. 80% of all matter in the universe is made from hydrogen. And it's the most abundant fuel source we know. Uh, we're just now getting around to the hydrogen age after uh, finding out that the fossil fuel age didn't work too good. I mean, what kind of advanced society are we that we're, we're burning our energy? <laughs> but you know, we, we tried the nuclear route, that didn't work out too well. You can ask the people from Fukushima and all the fish and water we poisoned in the Pacific, which is one of the reasons why Toyota's gone to fuel cells over batteries and nuclear and, uh, and other sources of fossil fuel energy. So the system here generates power no matter what. The big nuclear ball in the sky shows up for work every single day. If it doesn't, we got bigger problems. The panels, the black ones you see on the wall are what are called thin film. These panels are just like your old calculators that charge the battery just from indoor lighting. So they have one coating of silicon. They uh, absorb sunlight in conditions like this where we have low light conditions in the middle of winter. Um, and that, so I always get a charge regardless, even if there's snow on the rooftop panels, there's never snow on the side of the building. So uh, it's called backup to the backup. Um, solar is a great source of energy, but storage is the problem. Hydrogen is the ultimate battery. Like I said, no shelf life, and you can store multiple amounts by just adding more tanks, not buying more batteries that go bad every five years. Where it all starts, the fuel cell at the end is connected to all the tanks behind us. And that's what provides the power. That's been here for 14 years as well. So all of these things have long lifetimes. So we're now in the process of converting the house to where we're going to be uh, much smaller systems. This was a breadboard done 14 years ago. Now we're doing a, pro a, a product called the Jewel Box, which fits on a pallet. And the cost has gone from $500,000 down to $40,000. And it's gonna to continue to drop as more advancements occur and more mass production occur over the next couple of years. Plus we have more people getting into it like all the automakers that are gonna create infrastructure and techniques and technologies. Um, one of the biggest uh, things that occurred in the last two years is that Toyota is selling the vehicle, not leasing it so that it won't be who killed the electric car all over again, where they pull, all the automakers pulled back the leases and crushed the cars. That can't happen now because the technology has been released to the public. 5,500 patents are free to the world. Toyota is selling the vehicle 
So, and they're the largest automaker in the world. So the 10,000 pound gorilla has spoken and it's going to be hydrogen. And the name of that car? This is the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle that uh, they've been selling in California for about three years, soon coming to the Northeast. Uh, the vehicle itself has had millions of miles of uh, testing done on it in uh, boiling temperatures like the Mojave Desert all the way to uh, ultra cold temperatures 40 below in Alaska. <clears throat> the vehicles are crash tested, safe, um, and basically mass produced. This car I paid $60,000 for, um, and they're giving you $15,000 worth of free fuel on a credit card. Um, so the cars, you're practically giving it to you for free. Uh, the cars are leased for $300, uh, and they, uh, they currently three-year leases also with the same fuel deal. So Toyota has gone all out of its way now to you know, lose money on every one of these vehicles in order to get them out in society. Um, and they're putting in refueling stations as well. And they're doing biomass. There's a large plant in um, uh, Long Beach that's gonna provide uh, uh, two million kilograms of hydrogen for the fleets that are powering the ports. They've already developed hydrogen fuel cells, tractor trailers, freight, freight liners so that they're able to run these in the ports or run them across country. There's a company called uh, Nikola, which is uh, building fuel cell powered trucks. And uh, you have Proton on-site is now doing the refueling stations for those. So all the pieces are coming together where we'll have infrastructure, we'll have vehicles, we'll have service, we'll have mass production, we'll have reduction in cost to make the hydrogen society work. And, you know, obviously they're the naysayers in Texas and the Ohio, the places with fossil fuel vehicles are fighting this. Um, you know, we're going to have to adapt to a different economy than we did with the fossil fuel vehicles because there's no tune-ups, oil changes, brake jobs, catalytic converters, belts, mufflers, or hoses associated with a fuel cell vehicle, which means it's almost maintenance free except for tires, you know, body parts and a, and a few mechanical things. You know, it's kind of like LED bulbs. The Home Depots refused to sell it because they sold a bulb every 25 years. This is the same technology, but we get out of the throwaway society that China's created. So we're building things that will last a lifetime rather than last 10 minutes out of the box. So what you see, the graphic across the outside here shows where all the parts are laid out. So most people picture the engine as being under the seat. So you have your battery, um, for your, your uh, startup 12 volt battery. This is your refueling outlet here. I can actually open it up for you. So we'll push the fuel outlet. So this is where we fill the car. So we have a dispenser down here at the house. We plug it in and we fill the car up. Now you're looking at a four minute fill. Anybody can do it, it's not complicated. And what kind of range on the four minute fill? You, you get about 312 is what the EPA rate it is. I've done over 360 on the car. The car tells you how to drive it efficiently. So if you want to drive it efficiently, you can get a lot of miles out of it. Um, the car itself is uh, a Lexus. It's on a Lexus chassis. So it's got every bell and whistle that a Lexus has in it. So it's got the neoprene seats in it, but it has something that no other car has in it that's called the H2O button. When you push that button, it puts out about a half a gallon of water that you can drink. <laughs> where, do you, where do you collect the water? Uh, the water is collected out at the tailpipe. <laughs> so you're actually drinking the tailpipe emissions. All right, so welcome to the uh, bowels of the hydrogen house. Um, you know, so you got to see the energy generation system. Now we're actually showing you the reconversion system and all the other parts and pieces that make this off-grid home a reality. So 70% of all heat and air conditioning um, consumption is, is the largest energy portion of people's bills. So the geothermal will save 70% over conventional heat and air conditioning as far as cost goes. And the energy is free. High, geothermal energy is a renewable energy resource. So what this house had is for the last 26 years is the second geothermal system in the state that was ever put in. Um, we dug a hole in the front yard, 46 feet by 46 feet. We put in 56 loops, which is about a mile of thick wall copper tube. 
and we covered the dirt back up again. Those two lines come in right here, you can see, from the outside. So those are connected to that mile long of copper tubing. Those go down and they come in here to the heat pump. You can see they come in here, they go down. So this is a um, compressor, which is a scroll compressor, which means it's the most efficient available. When I started out the system, it had a, a piston compressor, then it went to a rotary compressor. Now the third stage is the scroll compressor. That means we're saving over 50% of the electrical energy that this system started out with 26 years ago, just from increases in the technology. The second big increase in the geothermal technology has been the air handler. The air handlers typically just turn on and run when the heat or the air conditioning cycle goes on. This air handler has incorporated what's called, which is called a humidity sensor. So uh, it measures the amount of humidity in the air during the air conditioning cycle, and it slows the blower up to a point where it moves the air very slowly across the coil. The coil is very cold, the air is moving slow. The minute the humidified air hits the coil, it basically turns into water and drops out. Once all of the air in the house has all the high humidity taken out of, then it goes into the air conditioning mode where the blower speeds up. Most of the energy that's used in the air conditioning system is to remove the humidity from the air. It's much more efficient to remove it with a cold coil and low airflow than it is at full speed. It will take almost twice as long. So you're looking that one change alone is a 30% increase in efficiency in that it's, it's much more effective to air condition low humidity air than high humidity air. Simple as that. Now this system incorporates a lot of birds in one stone. So during the air conditioning cycle, all right, we are taking 56 degree ground temperature and we're bringing it into the house through the compressor and putting it into the air. That means that we're not making any differential up. I'm not working against 90 degree hot air outside. I got 56 degree air. So I'm just bringing that cold temperature in through the heat pump and putting it in the house. So it costs no energy because I'm not making anything up. What happens is, is I generate 170 degree temperature when that gas expands and I pull all the heat out of the house. So typical systems would put that heat right back into the ground again to cool again. Not this system. This system uses this center unit which is called a D superheater. The D superheater takes and runs a double wall heat exchanger. So one wall runs the hot refrigerant gas I picked up and the inner loop runs uh, my hot water system. So this circulates through this through what, this first tank. So what it does is it exchanges cold water, 56 degree groundwater, with 170 degree hot water from the geothermal. So when the air conditioning system is running, I have unlimited amount of hot water, which heats the hot tub, the swimming pool, and the domestic hot water here in the house. So basically, not only am I heating and cooling my house, I'm also taking care of my hot water. Now, during the winter time, I may not have enough heat produced from the cycle to do it. So I hooked in a hydrogen hot water heater. So if there is not enough heat, the, 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 heater, the hydrogen heater will kick on and it will go ahead and it'll heat the hot water up to 120 or 130, whatever I want it to be set at. So I'm recovering all of the hot water from stuff that would normally be waste from the geothermal system. Okay, now we're down to the jewel box. So these were created for border crossings and special ops for the US military. These you can drop on the top of a mountain in the middle of a desert and they'll make water, they'll make oxygen, they'll make hydrogen, <clears throat> they'll make power and they'll work from wind or solar. So this is my hydrogen house in a box. We went public with this idea. So we have a company called H Cell Energy that anybody wants to invest is more than happy to look us up. But yeah, this is this is the way it's gonna be for a house power plant. We're gonna drop one of these things off, you're gonna lease the box and you'll have power. So technology, as you can see from the house setup is much smaller. Um, you know, look at the first cell phones that basically you needed to carry in a suitcase. You know, now you, you can fit them 
you know, you know, on your eyeglasses. So things have changed a lot, but this is the right concept because this can be used as a refueling station. It can be used to purify water. It can be used uh, for wind and solar energy remotely. Um, every place I checked last, the big nuclear ball in the sky shines at some point. So you can always catch capture the electrons. And what's I think the, there's a video for this one as well. What's the price point on something like this, Mike? Um, it's about 40,000 for the base box, 26 with the rebates. You're looking at about a five year payback. Then you, you're powering yourself for free. So everything that's in the hydrogen house here is in the jewel box. So this has fuel cell, electrolyzer, it has solar, it has wind, um, it has hydrogen storage, ultra capacitors, all in the same box. And this is expandable uh, up to any size home. And then these are also stackable. You can see another version here that's a high speed electric vehicle charge station. So I charge my Prius, my plug in Prius off of uh, the jewel box is all made from solar. Can you show us what's inside? So you have your charge controllers, you have your power distribution, your ultra capacitors, um, you have uh, battery banks on the bottom, and the back is hydrogen tanks, storage, fuel cell, all in the same box. So this is the first dedicated solar hydrogen home. We have a small video uh, showing the home that's been operating now for four years. So this is Elise de Tiberge, and she is a visionary. I'm going to call you a visionary because you had the vision to engage uh, Mike and JT to just completely transform your property. And we're interested to find out what, what motivated you and how did you find out about them, a little bit about you and your story. Yeah, it's a little bit, uh, it's, it's personal really. I was living in Skillman and sadly divorced and I wanted to minimize and, and find land to, for the future of my kids. And my goal, I came from two and a half acres and I, my goal was to find more than 10 to be a little farm and pharmacist and uh, forestry. And uh, Google and Google and I stumbled into this property and uh, that's how it started. How did you learn about the hydrogen aspect? Um, I, knew, I knew a friend who had installed solar way back then before I did Skillman and he mentioned the company in Flemington, uh, JT, James Trisky, and so on. And uh, I got into talk to his dad and to uh, all the members there, and I learned more and more, and I said, this is what I need. And no matter what, while doing construction here, it was all planned out, you know, they were consulted. What should I be doing inside before I started my construction and renovation? What should I be considering to be the most efficient and the most uh, well calculated energy, energy consumer? so my system will indeed pay off. Here we did it right, we uh, calculated every single usage on kilowatts from hair dryer, from my bath that I love to take, from every single induction cooking. Pennington doesn't have gas or, uh, or anything else, so we have to import it. And my way was solar and do induction cooking to minimize the time of consumption of consuming electricity. Uh, we calculated everything, the fans outside, every single detail we calculated. So besides, you said the induction uh, cooking, cooking, that's a big deal. What other kinds of big adjustments? Uh, I did a more than the standard insulation in mm -hmm. between walls. Okay. Uh, and that's important. Uh, the uh, All the units I buy is mindfully geared towards that, the water tank, hot water tanks mm -hmm. for the house mm -hmm. use. 
uh, the toilet shoes. What kind of toilets did you change? You, you, your you have, uh, well, I had to put new, everything new. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, you have pressure? the, yeah, pressure, and you have the one that uses half, you know, for number one, half for number two, and uh, so that's less consumption of uh, water mm -hmm. from the well, mm -hmm. and, and on and on. Uh, LED lights. LED light, absolutely a most uh, mm -hmm. upgrade in electrical uh, components. Mm -hmm. um, Energy Star uh, appliances. Uh, uh, yes, yes. The, the, uh, I have a uh, heat pump, yeah. mm -hmm. which is the most economical. It's like a, the Rolls Royce in all the uh, heating mm -hmm. uh, compressors and heating units in a home. And you have zones, heating zones in the house? I have three zones, mm -hmm. though the place is very small inside, but I have three zones. Mm -hmm. What we basically have here is a micro form factor of what you saw at the Stritsky residence in, in Hopewell. Uh, the solar here is really what drives most of the ship, is what I say. It really is the, the driving force of everything that powers the utilities here. So essentially the sun provides power to the solar panels. Up at the end of the array we have the inverters which takes the DC power, converts it to the usable AC power, and then that power is funneled back into the utility service back at the house. So as we're looking at this, what kind, what amount of energy is being captured here? This is a total of almost 37 kW I believe it is. I should know my numbers a little bit better, it's been a while. But there's 144 panels here, 270 watts each, so I believe that's around 37 kW is what that comes down to DC power and then we funnel that up into inverters up at the root up at the end of the array which takes that 37 kW in DC form and then forms it into usable power that's used used at the house and uh, to run the rest of the components that are there so this is the part of the system that converts the DC power into usable AC power for your loads. What's really cool about this system is it's in New Jersey and we're connected to the utility and the utility actually has mandates to provide renewable energy credits or renewable energy portfolio to the customers. So what this system does is it actually accumulates and records the amount of kilowatt hours for that portfolio requirement. It's called the SREC market, Sustainable Renewable Energy Credits. So what this system over here does is it accumulates all the power and then these two meters over here record the amount of generation over time and in New Jersey what's really great is every thousand kilowatt hours is a megawatt hour and for every megawatt hour that you produce you get a credit and for every credit it's like a token or a stock it's now you can sell it on the open market and there's a going rate of around 200 to 225 dollars right now for those credits so a system like this will produ produce probably around 40 to 45 to 50 credits on a good year per year so 50 times 200 that's 10 you know doing the math right is that what two a thousand ten thousand dollars hopefully i'm doing the math right ten thousand dollars in just credits a year from new jersey just by being connected to the grid and then producing the power. Wow. So that's what's really great about these units. 10,000 might be a little bit high, but you, know, you, can, you can extrapolate from there so too. So let me ask you, there's power that's being generated. It's going to get stored in batteries? It also? will eventually, yeah, so absolutely. So how does that work with the credits? Like. So what happens is we always basically supply power to the loads first, and then once the batteries are full, then you give to the grid. Then we give back to the grid. So these are what are called grid tied inverters. Okay, so the solar, the AC production from the solar comes in into the house or the garage over here into this load panel. It's landed here. Here's basically the solar production coming in. That solar production is then fed through these inverters. There's four of these inverters throughout this wall. And these inverters divert the power to either the loads at the house, which he has another load panel over there on the other side of the garage, or to a big bank of batteries, which we have in the back over here. So essentially what happens is the solar produces enough power to provide all the power for her loads, charge the batteries. In excess, it'll go to the grid. And then, or if we don't want it to go to the grid, we can also produce hydrogen on site from that as well. So that's, so there's a myriad of things going on in here through these inverters essentially is diverting the power accordingly. Yeah, so what we have here too is this is a grid tied battery backup system. In addition to the battery backup, we have a hydrogen fuel cell technology infrastructure which extends the range of our battery backup is what I like to say. So, but essentially the difference between a standard grid tied PV system and a battery backup system is you don't have this equipment for, for a standard grid tied PV system. You don't have a battery backup set, you don't have inverters that'll take the stored battery power and provide you usable power. 
Um, so the difference here, again, is that we have a lot more equipment such that if the grid does go down, we can provide power for the customer or for the homeowner at any time, along with providing power to turn on the solar and, if necessary, run the, run the generator for the hydrogen side of things. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that if they have solar and the grid goes down, you actually don't have solar anymore. Oh. So that's why it necessitates the need for a battery backup system. So if you have solar, if the grid goes down, a lot of people are saying, hey, I have solar, why, you know, why can't I have it power my house right now? Well, the main reason why, and the technical reason why is the, the uh, a few technical reasons why is the inverters that, you, produce the power in the solar need to see a grid signal. Oh. That's so that they don't provide power back to the grid when there's a grid failure. It's a way so that you can prevent linemen from being hurt. It's an, it's an islanding. It's called anti-islanding. UL 1741, I believe, is the standard. Um, so the main difference there, again, is those grid-tied inverters just go directly to the grid in a normal situation to a load panel without the remainder of this other equipment. So this battery backup, if the, if the grid went down, how long would the battery backup? The battery backup, depending on loads, so she's since added loads, but originally it was probably a, a week or so with solar batteries at night, solar batteries at night, and then the, the hydrogen would give her extended range and extended capabilities above and beyond that, depending on the stored supply. Okay, but you said the solar's not going to work if the grid's down. Well, so that these take the place of the grid gotcha. in the event of a grid failure. Okay. So that's the idea behind having all of these. These form from batteries that grid signal that those inverters need to see. Ah, okay. So and it's all localized. It's all localized. So these basically, once the grid goes away, these units that have a transfer switch in them will detect the grid signal failing, disconnect from the grid, and go into a microgrid mode is what we what's what called what is called producing their own power from DC DC power, producing the AC sine wave required to turn on the inverters for the solar. That now provides power for the house, charges the batteries when necessary, and the cycle continues. So could this system truly be entirely off-grid? Yes, the, it could uh, be. The only advantage of being tied into the grid is that you get that big credit. Yeah, so the more, the more kilowatt hours that your system produces and is connected to the grid, the more financial return and incentive you have in New Jersey. Now, in off-grid applications, you're just going to put that power into more storage, be it batteries, be it hydrogen, and now you're just extending your off-grid capabilities. Okay, great. So Perfect. that's the big difference. All right, so the system, we haven't seen the whole system yet, but the system that was installed here, if you're looking at overall cost, what? The overall cost of this project before any incentives was 175000 Okay. around, give or take, plus or minus. Okay. So that includes the solar, the batteries here, the battery backup function, the hydrogen functionality, the underground storage tank that's in the ground, and now you get to then recapture some of the incentives here. So you have the federal ITC credit, which right now for another year is 30%. That will slowly transition down to a, to a minimum of 10%, which will retain there for a while if legislation doesn't change. You also can, um, her being a farm may allow her to depreciate a lot of the equipment. I may be misspeaking there, so you know we can look at that. But um, then you also have the, uh, you don't have a power bill anymore. So that's a nice generation, and then your, your power is being generated from the solar, and then you have the SREX. So there's a number of ways that New Jersey, specifically because of the SREX, are incentivizing and subsidizing the cost of the installation. So right, I think before uh, the state subsidies and other incentives after the uh, ITC, it was like 135 grand. Is what okay. they want to say, something and along those any lines. Any idea of when it's projected to be paid off? There was. I can look at a financial model that we put together for this, but. I would say with her system, it was actually probably a little bit extended again because it was an early adopter, newer technologies that were being done at the time, um, seven or eight years, I want to say. Well, that's, that's well, extraordinary. Well, yeah, well, normal solar, just solar alone right now, if you're a business, is you're cash positive in year two. Wow. If I you're have a business, no idea. if you have tax equity, if you have the ability to go and depreciate all the equipment, you can basically take bonus depreciation of all the equipment and take 85% of it the first year if you're eligible for all these you know, for all of these caveats. Okay. So, residential so so solar is probably 3-4 year payback period, like on a real short if you get somebody does this solar the right way and you know, you you get the get it structured correctly. Um, that's if you buy the system outright. Mm -hmm. Now, if you lease it or do PPAs, which there are a lot of other financial mechanisms to have solar be installed where there's no cost to the customer outright then there's longer period longer terms and things like that okay so it's, very, it's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff to it actually yeah, yeah there is yeah there is okay so what we have here is the battery bank 
Um, basically what this is here for is to store the excess energy from the solar. When there's not enough load uh, in the house to take all the solar, we store the excess power here. When these are full, we'll generate hydrogen to store in the tank, and when the hydrogen is full, the tank full is full, we'll send that power back to the grid. So the purpose of this battery bank here is to provide power when the grid fails. We're basically allowing this, this system here along with the inverters on the wall to act as the grid in the event of a grid failure. So we have the, the power stored from the batteries here that's produced from the solar, and then we have an extra storage in the hydrogen as well. So these are basically all wired up in parallel and then sent the power over to this large battery combiner that, you have, that we have back here and then you know, is then funneled back to all of the individual inverters. Yeah, so these are six volt AGM absorbed glass mat uh, batteries. They're wired into 48 volt battery packs and then essentially you have that power going into the large battery combiner again. So what you see here is the hydrogen side of things here at this installation. On uh, this side of the cabinet is a hydrogen fuel cell. It's what consumes the hydrogen that's been produced on site. Um, it's capable of producing 1100 watts of DC power which is then funneled back into the battery bank back into the garage that you were seeing. So this is essentially a battery charger or a range extender to the batteries when they're being utilized. This system will communicate with the batteries based on voltage. If the battery voltage gets below a certain threshold, the unit turns on and provides supplemental power. If the battery voltage reaches a certain high point, you know, it's set float voltage, it will then turn off after a set period of time and just go back to standby and wait to, re wait to provide power when required. Um, the way we get hydrogen is similar to the exact same unit that you saw back at the, uh, the shop. The H2 to go is going to be installed on the other side of this unit. Um, it then prov produces hydrogen from a standard outlet that, you see, that we have installed on the bottom of the box. We have a water tank also installed on the outside door of this on the other side. We can show you that. And then it basically produces hydrogen is funneled down to an underground storage tank, very similar to, again, it's a thousand gallon propane tank, similar to what you guys saw at the, uh, the installation over in Hopewell. This one just happens to be buried underground. Um, that's located back here. It's, again, it's a thousand gallon propane tank. It's 16 feet this way and four feet in diameter overall. So the, uh, basically that's where the main shutoff valve for it as well. The hydrogen comes in underground onto, uh, with stainless steel piping to a main fuel lockout valve right here. And then that valve pro provides the hydrogen pressure to the regulator inside the unit and supplies the fuel cell unit itself. So th the whole process is we produce power from the solar panels. We provide loads from the solar to the house. When the loads are met, we charge up the batteries. When the batteries are full, we provide hydro we provide provide power to the hydrogen unit to store, produce and store hydrogen underground. In the event of a grid failure, we then utilize this, the hydrogen or the, uh, the battery storage power to produce uh, power to, for the uh, inverters out in the, uh, the grid or I'm sorry, on the array. The array produces enough power for the house and the cycle continues. When everything else is full, if the grid is still present, when the hydrogen is done being produced, we're selling power back to the grid. Mike, thank you so much. You are truly creating a whole new world for us with, with hydrogen. I mean, it's opening up doors for a, a world that isn't relying on fossil fuels and that is ecologically sound? I want to close my eyes every night and know if I don't get up tomorrow, I made the world a better place. That's awesome, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Keep the momentum going by checking out all the other experts. Every one of them has invaluable information that you can't afford to miss. Buy the Premium Summit Package now. Join the global conversation in our Facebook group and take action in your home, community, or the world at large. Together, we will shape a world that works.